I, my name is Jonathan Newman. I'm a, um, a full-time fellow at the Mises Institute. Uh, my full title is the Henry Hazlitt Research Fellow, and, and I'm very happy to be there, um, and very happy to see all of you here. But I think the, um, it's not really an accident, but it's great the way our topics lined up here, sort of looking at the different aspects of our limitless regime, looking at it from foreign policy perspective, and I'm going to be looking at it from the money and banking perspective. So I, I looked at the, um, the title for our event, Against Our Limitless Regime, and I, was, I wanted to approach it from the perspective of what enables our limitless regime? Like what, what makes it possible for us to describe it as, as, as limitless? And so obviously I'm looking at money and the central bank, the Fed. So the money supply is measured by M2 doubled from 2013 to 2023. And about 60% of that increase happened in the two years after 2020. And if we take a longer view of monetary history, we see that the dollar has lost about 97% of its purchasing power since the Fed was created in 1913. And a lot of that deterioration happened uh, since the closure of the Bretton Woods uh, system in the early 1970s. So it was like a huge, um, huge increase in the, in the speed at which our dollar is losing value. <clears throat> but since the closure of Bretton Woods, there's no hard constraint on, on our monetary policy. And if there's no constraint on our monetary policy, it means that there's no constraint on government debt. And if there's no constraint on government debt, then there's no constraint on spending. And so our government can just grow and grow in size and in scope. And really the only thing that's holding it back these days is the unpopularity of price inflation. <clears throat> but even the unpopularity of price inflation isn't much of a constraint when the left has convinced so many people that price inflation is because of greed. And they're right in a sense, uh, but it's not the greed of private business. It's the greed of the bureaucratic state, the military industrial complex, and the politicians who know how to point the money spigot uh, to fill up their own vote buckets. One of Thomas Sowell's most famous quotes is, the first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. And Ludwig von Mises concluded his magnum opus, Human Action, with a warning about disregarding the lessons of economics. He said, quote, the body of economic knowledge is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. And if we ignore it, then we will stamp out society and the human race. So we need to pay attention to what economics says. And my goal today is to convince you that no institution ignores the lessons of economics more than the Federal Reserve. We live in a world of limits. Like I said, the first lesson of economics. We have limited housing, limited energy, limited, limited food, and limited time. And yet the beauty of the market economy, as um, explained by Ludwig von Mises and his greatest student, uh, Murray Rothbard, um, is, that, is the way that we make the best use of our limited resources through market prices, profit and loss, and entrepreneurship. Only voluntary interaction in markets makes it possible for us to not only allocate scarce resources to their highest valued uses, but also relieve that constraint some by expanding production and accumulating capital. It takes raw human ingenuity and cooperation for us to emerge from subsistence and uh, achieve the sort of abundance that would make the kings of old envious today. It requires private property, the division of labor, trust, and the willingness to delay gratification. And if we abandon these, as Mises said, we will definitely see civilization in decline. But the Federal Reserve laughs in the face of scarcity. They think they can overcome scarcity with a limitless supply of green pieces of paper. In good times and in bad times, the answer from the central bank is always more money. And our MMT friends say that limitless money and government debt are a good thing that the only way uh, for the private economy to grow is for the public sector to become increasingly indebted. And they say that the government's red ink makes our black ink possible. And they come to this conclusion by manipulating accounting truisms and falling back on the line that money is a creation of the state and therefore money cannot constrain the state. <clears throat> to counter this, we only need to look to Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, who showed uh, that money is not a creation of the state but actually came about organically through the market process. Market participants started using money because it helped them accomplish their own individual goals by cooperating with each other in trading. 
Menger showed, showed us that the institution of money is a great achievement of the market economy. And with this correct history of the origin of money in view, we can see that throughout history, governments have co-opted money. They did not create it, they stole it. They clipped coins, debased the metals, introduced paper promises that were only partially backed by gold and teamed up with banks who were happy to, to do the same. And the banks were happy to, to collaborate with the state as long as they were protected from competition and from the consequences of credit expansion. So to take over the institution of money, the state has had to pile on increasing amounts of regulation and institute a central banking system that has grown to gargantuan proportions. And I want to review with you briefly uh, some of the episodes in which the state has, uh, the Federal Reserve has expanded its own power and its own mission. And to show that this is no secret, I've pulled all of this from the Federal Reserve's own website, its own telling of its own history. This, uh, the website's name is federalreservehistory.org or something like that, but you can access it through a link from the federalreserve.gov. So I'm not pulling this stuff from Murray Rothbard's History of Money and Banking in the United States. So the Fed began with an austere mandate, quote, founded by an act of Congress in 1913, the Federal Reserve's primary purpose was to enhance the stability of the American banking system. And I'll let you judge if they've accomplished that goal. Though the next main event in their history sort of gives it away. Around the time of the 1929 market crash and the Great Depression, they decided that, quote, the central bank should issue money when production and commerce expanded and contract the supply of currency and credit when economic activity contracted. And of course, we know from Austrian business cycle theory that oftentimes the causation goes the other way, that when the Fed is printing up money, then they can blow up bubbles and start artificial booms. And when they let up on that, then they cause the contraction or the, they cause the artificial boom to turn to bust. But notice that in just a few years, the scope of the Federal Reserve expanded from enhancing the stability of the banking system to trying to steer all economic activity by manipulating the money supply. So let's fast forward to World War II. <clears throat> Quote from the website, when the United States entered the war, the Board of Governors issued a statement indicating that the Federal Reserve System was prepared to use its powers to assure at all times an ample supply of funds for financing the war effort. Financing the war was the focus of the Federal Reserve's wartime mission. And this mission differed, this is still a quote from the website, this mission differed from the mission of the system before and after the war, end quote. So they've explicitly admitted that their mission has changed. In World War II, they realized that they could not tax the American people enough to pay for the war. And so they resorted to the inflation tax. Taxes are visible and unpopular, but inflation is subtle. And, and I think it's this observation that led uh, Ron Paul to say that it's no coincidence that the century of total war coincided with the century of central banking. <clears throat> so at the end of World War II, the Bretton Woods system was implemented, which uh, constituted a promise by the US government to redeem dollars for gold so that countries around the world would feel confident in holding green pieces of paper in, uh, as a reserve currency instead of gold. And this system worked for a little while, but of course the government couldn't constrain itself. And when it noticed that it couldn't finance its spending without causing gold to drain from the US, it expanded the Fed's mission again. So during Bretton Woods, quote from the website, the Treasury and the Fed combined forces to maintain a cautious monetary policy heedful of international payments imbalances. So if we could do like a little mid uh, stock taking here, so far their mission has expanded from stabilizing the banking system, steering all economic activity with an elastic money supply, financing war spending, and now trying to maintain the dollar's dominant status in international trade. And of course, like I said, the Bretton Woods system couldn't be maintained. It proved impossible to, for the government to spend and inflate as much as it wanted and keep its promise to redeem dollars for gold. The Fed's own telling of its history continues, quote, they would tolerate an employment rate of up to four and a half percent, but by the end of the 1969-1970 recession, the unemployment rate had climbed to six percent, and inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index was 5.4 percent. So in the 70s, they got caught in a bind, and so the Fed's new mission was now to try to balance the unemployment rate and, and price inflation. And that's where the dual mandate came into play. So now the Fed is tasked with balancing the, these big macroeconomic aggregates, uh, but we've already seen that the Fed had, had been given or had assumed many other missions and tasks. And in 1977, they added another mandate to the so-called dual mandate. And that was to, to have moderate long-term interest rates. And then in the 80s, we had too big to fail come on the scene. 
And so another quote from the website, they, uh, the run on one of the banks uh, stopped when the FDIC, Federal Reserve, and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, after vigorous internal debate about a range of possible options, announced a temporary assistance program. But of course, there's, no, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. <clears throat> Well, all of the other episodes that we've covered so far, all these other episodes of mission creep, uh, involve the Fed taking on additional roles in managing the economy in general. This one represents a special kind of new power. With too big to fail, now the Fed could identify specific institutions and, and bail them out um, if they deem them as systematically important. And remember what I said about the importance of profit and loss earlier. Well, if you play the, the Fed's rigged game well enough and cozy up to them when times are tough, they will point the money printer in your direction and you never need to worry about the market test again. Then in the 90s, we had the Graham-Leach-Bliley, which was a, a law that gave the Fed the role of umbrella supervisor. This role was seen as necessary because these large and complex financial institutions had risk spread across their subsidiaries, but managed it as a consolidated entity. Someone, and of course the Fed would volunteer for this, had to oversee the operation of all of the moving parts. And what did the Fed do with all this accumulated power? Well, when the dot-com bubble popped, they worked on blowing up a housing bubble, which as we all know ended in disaster, a disaster that gave the Fed another opportunity to expand. And so in, in the 2007-2008 crisis, they, quote, lowered short-term interest rates to nearly 0%, took additional steps to lower uh, long, longer term interest rates and stimulate economic activity. And this included buying large quantities of long term treasury bonds and mortgage backed securities that funded prime mortgages. The Federal Reserve committed itself to purchasing long term securities until the job market substantially improved and to uh, keeping short term interest rates low until unemployment levels declined. So now they have a built in moving goalpost. We've come a long way from the Fed's original mission to stabilize the banking system. Now, the Fed can buy whatever it wants in whatever quantity it wants for any reason that it says. They haven't updated their website to include what happened since 2020, but thankfully their friends at the Brookings Institution uh, have what we're looking for. So in, in this article where they're explaining what the Fed has done since 2020, it's, it's a huge article, but they say the Federal Reserve stepped in with a broad array of actions to keep credit flowing, to limit the economic damage from the pandemic. These included large purchases of U.S. government and mortgage-backed securities and lending to support households, employers, and financial market participants, and state and local governments. And in 2020, Jerome Powell, uh, Fed Chair, said, we are deploying these lending powers to an unprecedented extent and will continue to use these powers forcefully, proactively, and aggressively until we are confident that we are solidly on the road to recovery. And really, the, um, I will share the, the website with you if you're interested, but like there's just heading after heading of all of the different new things, unprecedented things that the, the Fed did just in the past three years with direct lending to corporate employers, the commercial paper funding facility, the term asset backed. Uh, securities loan facility, direct lending to local governments, uh, another dose of quantitative easing. It's just a huge list. But they summed it up nicely at the, at the end of the article. The Fed supplied unlimited liquidity to financial institutions so they could meet credit drawdowns and make new loans to businesses and households feeling financial strains. Unlimited liquidity. So let's take stock. So just, just a brief review of what the Fed has done throughout its history. We've got 10 missions that they've accumulated over time. Stabilizing the banking system, steering all economic activity with an elastic money supply, financing war spending and government spending in general, maintaining the dollar status in international trade, balancing price inflation and unemployment, that's the famous one that they call the dual mandate, maintaining moderate long-term interest rates, bailing out too big to fail financial institutions, regulating not just banks, but all financial institutions, and use this balance sheet to buy any kind of distressed asset, and finally, supply unlimited money to financial markets in distress. This is a huge undertaking. And it's no surprise that the Fed has ballooned in size. So since 2008, its balance sheet is like eight times uh, what it was. And it's not just the size of its balance sheet that's important here. It's also the variety of things that, that they're purchasing and, and the variety of new missions and goals that they've adopted. So it's not just a quantitative thing, but a qualitative thing. <clears throat> Even if you're unfamiliar with the Fed's history, you've probably seen the Fed grow in importance over the past few decades. 
they used to be somewhat in the background. They were just another boring government agency doing boring things. People didn't really pay attention. But now all eyes are on the Fed when it makes its announcements. The entire financial sector is enthralled by FOMC meetings when they occur. Everyone watches the Fed chair as he simply reads the transcript of an announcement that was published online. Financial news media post moment by moment commentary on minutiae like small textual changes in the tone of Jerome Powell's voice. Fed watching has become a sport with cheerleaders, teams, the Bulls versus the Bears, live commentary and an unhealthy amount of gambling. And unlike the NFL, Fed watching has actually grown in popularity in the past few years. But Fed watching isn't just a game. There are real stakes and broad repercussions for correctly guessing whether Jay Powell will see his shadow when he emerges from the FOMC den. Roger Koppel commented on the way the Fed has become a big player. He's got a book called uh, Big Players. The Fed has become a big player in financial markets. He said, quote, the market would reward entrepreneurs who could correctly anticipate the actions of the big player, resulting in a reallocation of resources toward Fed watching. Now we realize that the costs of a gargantuan central bank are even bigger than the inflation and business cycles uh, they generate. Every Econ 101 student learns that we incur opportunity costs when we use scarce resources. And one of those scarce resources is our own attention. Entrepreneurs are forced by the very nature of the Fed's rigged game to pay attention to how much Jay Powell's brow glistens when he announces updated uh, projections of core C, uh, PCE inflation. And this attention comes at the expense of what entrepreneurs would be focused on, namely satisfying consumer desires, if there wasn't a big money printer circus coming into town uh, on a regular basis. So when we think about the Fed, we often think about it in quantitative terms, uh, like the amount of money it creates. But as we've seen in our brief review of its history, the qualitative aspects of the Fed are just as limitless as the money supply under its control. In every crisis, the Fed seems to grow not just in its balance sheet and money printing, but in its power and mission. I wonder if all of the changes to its mission are because it's so obviously failed on its accumulated goals uh, with each crisis. Each crisis highlights that fact. What this means is that we can predict what might happen when, not if, the next crisis occurs. We should never let the Fed convince us that they've solved the business, crisis, the business cycle problem or the, the bank run problem. They sometimes say this, uh, usually not the Fed chair, but so other Fed officials will come up and say, yeah, we've learned our lesson. We know how to stop the business cycle now. We know how to prevent financial crises in the future. Don't believe them when they say that. So when the next crisis comes, expect more expansion of power and control. Personally, I think that they've been priming the pump for a CBDC and we'll roll it out soon when uh, everybody is distracted by some crisis. A central bank digital currency would be the coup de grace for sound money. While the ending of Bretton Woods removed the gold constraint on the dollar, going purely digital would remove even the cash constraint on the dollar. Under Bretton Woods, remember, they couldn't inflate as much because they, uh, they couldn't inflate as much as they wanted because if they did, it caused gold to drain out of US reserves to other countries that were holding our paper. It's weaker today, but the threat of depositors pulling cash out of the banking system poses a similar threat. If cash is outlawed or effectively replaced by a digital dollar, there would be no physical constraint at all on inflation. Of course, another serious issue with the CBDC is that it would mean zero privacy. And with the political and cultural battles being waged today, this is extremely important. Imagine not being able to spend your, your own income on items the government deems dangerous, which is a list that grows daily. Imagine the tax and redistribution implications. Imagine the ease of imposing negative interest rates, a dream of central banks, uh, but never realizable due to the, the permanent nominal face value of cash. Of course, they view all these things as benefits. There are, these are state-of-the-art, sophisticated monetary policy tools and mechanisms. You can see them salivating over the tyrannical opportunities, especially at the World Economic Forum events. Uh, at one in China this year, Ezwar Prasad said this, if you think about the benefits of digital money, there are huge potential gains. It's not just about digital forms of physical currency. You can have programmability, units of central bank currency with expiry dates. You could have a potentially better, or some might say darker, world where the government decides that units of central bank money 
can be used to purchase some things, but not other things it deems less desirable. And he said, that is, a very, that is very powerful in terms of the use of a CBDC. <clears throat> so we see the direction they've gone, or they've come, and we see uh, that they're giving us a preview of the direction that they're going. And the direction that they're going is complete control over money, complete control over your income, complete control over your saving, and complete control over your spending. Our only hope for sound money is in the idea of limits and constraint. Precious metals like gold and silver have natural and built-in limits, uh, and market-based limits as well, and that's a good thing. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies also have built-in limits. Economics starts and ends with human action in a world of scarcity, and entrepreneurs are very uh, clued into that fact. They're faced with constraints every day, and they have to face the market test every day. But central banks cannot be trusted to restrain themselves. It's in their nature to expand, as we saw in our brief review of, of the Federal Reserve's history. Expand the money supply, expand credit, and expand their own power. This is why I'm dissatisfied with any attempt at reforming the Fed, and the only solution is to end it. Thank you. So, uh, you want to do some Q&A? Yeah, we have a couple minutes for Q&A. There's a microphone coming around. Okay, this is kind of a softball question, but if, uh, if the Fed is so powerful and they just become more and more powerful, then, uh, and you see CBDCs as kind of the next thing, well, what's, what's to stop them from the idea of floating, oh, let's just do away with all taxation and, and spend, I mean, pay for everything with the money crank? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I mentioned the MMT crowd in, in my talk, and I think that's something that they, they've discussed. And they said that, well, if the, if the government is not con constrained by money, then we can, just, we can just use the printing press to fund all spending. And we'll use taxation as a separate policy lever, basically, to control price inflation. Uh, so, I mean, they, they're already talking about that sort of prospect. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the hope or any source of optimism in this is, I think, I think there's a chance for the implementation of a CBDC to be another instance of the state overplaying its hand, which I, I was discussing at our table. I think, this, I think the state has done that in the past three years, uh, as evidenced by all of the distrust in the media, the distrust for the establishment. And I think, I think there's enough distrust of the idea of a CBDC that if implemented, um, and, and they start using that for funding all of their spending, um, but just pure inflation to do that, then I think that'd be another instance of that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Newman. Um, given the last 111 years of monetary history, I think most, most Austrians would assume the dollar would die from heart disease. Uh, but looking at the rise of potentially a BRICS currency, Saudi Arabia, you know, selling the oil in, in yuan, is it possible that we there's international competition that might cause the the death of the dollar's reserve status? I I don't think so. I, I don't think because the the BRICS nations they they've uh, come up with proposals and they've tried to. Uh, and I think it's mainly just sort of a PR stunt each time they do that. They're just trying to you know chip away at the um, the, the reputation. But I mean, so far, none of it has been successful. I'm, I'm doubtful that the current iteration of this would, would be successful. Um, I think, it, I mean, despite how inflationary our central bank is, um, I, I do think there's something to the fact that other major central banks are more inflationary than uh, even our uh, central bank, which means that there, w the dollar has at least that much going for it. Thanks for your talk, Dr. Newman. Um, I I, this may be naive, but I, I have doubts that they can actually implement a CBDC because I guess I just don't understand how it would work. Like, who's going to take money in payment for goods or services that expires? You know, like, won't it just cause massive capital flight into other instruments? You know, like paper dollars, gold, Bitcoin. Like, can they really do that without collapsing the entire system? That's what I wonder. Well, I think, I think they wouldn't start off with that. I think they would start off with uh, little... Uh, bite-sized rewards, so like maybe just a small interest rate if you if you convert your bank account over to this new specified type. 
Um, and it could be something that's actually, uh, that we don't, we don't e even uh, see, that we're not even aware of when it happens. So they could, they could do it without us noticing, but also they, I don't think they would start off with the negative interest rates. I think that's something that they would pull out when there's a crisis. And the, and the reason why people would still accept it if there's expiry dates is they, they would have to have the anticipation that they would be able to spend it before the, the currency unit expires. But I, I agree, it's, uh, it's, it's almost, it's so outlandish to even to think about. Do you, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you think that the uh, funds that they sent out to everybody's checking account during the uh, COVID crisis is a preliminary to this? A test? They got everybody's bank account number now. I I think so. I th I think that's one way that they've been uh, priming the pump. But also, you see, the Federal Reserve is is writing papers talking about, uh, and they call it the pros and cons of CBDCs or the the risks and the potential benefits. Um, and so, yeah, I I think. Basically, anything that involves the central bank is they're just sort of paving the way. They're just getting ready to to implement the new expansion of their own power. And it, I think any, it, it's not just the like the checks that you mentioned, but the, I mean the fact that all of our bank accounts are with banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System. It means that they're I mean they're ready. They they have everything that they need to put it in place. Everything except for just uh, majority consent. Hi, can you give me your thoughts on? This new, I, I can't remember, what it is. it's the orb coin, this eyeball thing that's going around the world now taking people's eye, eye details but giving them $49 as a reward because it's a new world token. I, I'm not familiar with that, but it, I don't like it. <laughs> no, those are my thoughts. Hi, so speaking as a mother of young children, what can we do to protect ourselves, our assets, our families from the inevitable here? What's your recommendation? So I'm, I also have small children. Um, it's it's tough because it's it is very well, so, so far. There's been a lot of pessimism today, and it doesn't look like uh, the world is going in a great direction. Uh, but I think I think there's hope in establishing strong communities. So I, I think the the extent to which you can connect with your neighbors, like real people next next door to you, um, and, and in your in your neighborhoods, I think that that's that's probably the the best thing that that you could be working on now. Not not necessarily like getting into this asset versus that asset, but the softer things that we don't emphasize. I mean, obviously, saving is better than not saving. Obviously. Um, uh, getting into, I think, precious metals is a good idea if you're expecting a collapse or, or depending on what your own expectations are. Um, but I think the softer things that we don't necessarily think of first, I think we need to emphasize those things. So community uh, and also I, I think just education. So I, I hear so many sad stories of parents talking about how their, their kids went to college and they came back totally brainwashed. Um, and so I think uh, when, when it comes to kids and families, I think Making sure that we're, I mean, indoctrination is a bad word, but it's not bad if the doctrines are good, right? So, so, so teach them uh, while they're impressionable and while, while you have that chance to do that. So those are my thoughts. Here's the last question. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, na name said, how you doing, sir? So I wanted to kind of piggyback on the, on the other question. So I want to ask, what if things don't work out, you know, Argentina could could elect the libertarian president. Do you think moving over there might be an option to, in case things just go buck wild crazy here? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I think each person, each family is going to adopt a different strategy that works for them. Um, I, I'm personally not going to do that sort of thing, but I, I do know that uh, uh, there are other uh, families and other people who have uh, expatriated and they're living very happy lives, uh, and I'm happy for them. Um, but but my own personal strategy doesn't include that. I, I like my neighborhood. I like being around my grand, my uh, parents and my kids' grandparents. Uh, so, so I, I'm personally, like I said with the previous question, I'm going to work on strengthening my own surroundings, my own community and neighborhood. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to switch over to lunch, and so the the buffet table I think is is ready for us uh, just outside in the hallway. Thank you very much. Thank you.